And so just starting off with this slide, you can see that bottled terrariums can be varied in size and shape, as well as their level of complexity. And so we'll talk about that as we go forward on what exactly a terrarium is, what is required to create a terrarium, as well as what do we need to consider, what do we need to think about, and the different types of terrariums. But before we get started with all that, I just want to say a special thanks to Candace Hart. This presentation is a modified version of her terrarium workshop she did a couple of years ago, and so I'm excited to be sharing it with you today. So starting off, what is a terrarium? A terrarium is a tightly closed glass or plastic container that is filled with small plants. This can be, like I said, glass or plastic, but it does need to be translucent. So you should be able to see it or have some kind of transparency with it. Another type of terrarium can be an open terrarium, which is made with a transparent container that is used for growing and displaying plants. So this might be something uh, as simple as a, a, what I would call a dessert piece of cookery or bakeware, like a trifle where it's full up the sides and it it's on a stand, but it's clear and it's glass, but it has no lid to the container. This could also be something like a glass bowl or a clear plastic bowl, but there's no lid to it. And this is a fun, novel way to grow many different plants with minimum care. So uh, I know many people out there love to garden, but it's one of those things that we have to schedule into our daily routine to make sure that all of our plants are happy. And this is one way to enjoy plants with some of those minimal cares. If we have them tightly closed, then we don't have to water and tend to them as closely as we would a potted or a outdoor garden. So let's start with a little bit of history about terrariums. And so the use of transparent containers for growing plants date back at least 2,500 years to Gre in Greece, where they were using these transparent containers to keep and grow plants. They weren't designed, they were using these concepts that we now refer to with terrarium building, but they weren't considering them terrariums at that time. And so the actual invention of a terrarium is credited to Dr. Nathaniel ba Bagshaw Ward, who was actually a 19th century London physician. So not a person who was in the garden trade, but he was a physician. And what Dr. Ward did is he was transporting plants after he noticed the effects of a hermetically sealed glass container on the plants that he had in for a sphinx moth chrysalis. And so his original concept for this was putting some plants in there, but using it as a butterfly or a moth container for them while they're in their chrysalis phase. And so the original container had a sphinx moth chrysalis, some damp soil at the bottom of a bottle, and he covered it with a lid. A week later, he noticed that a fern and a grass seedling had sprouted from the soil that he had put in there. 
with his peaked interest, he saw that the evaporated moisture then condensed on the walls of the bottle during the day, and it ran back into the soil, maintaining a constant humidity. And using this information, he then not only used it to rear butterflies, but he included plants in there that were used for growing and introducing new plants to British colonies that were a long distance away. And so in 1842, he published a book on all of this that he had been discovering with his glass cases. And it's called On the Growth of Plants in Closely Glazed Cases. And so this led to what was referred to then as a Wardian case, and it was a large enclosed container uh, that was used for decoration of plants in a home or using them to transport them long distances. And here are a couple of examples of what these Wardian cases looked like. So you can see some of them had wood holding them up, making them like they were on a table. There were some that were what I would call chalice shaped that have a stand or a handle and they all had different varying designs with them. Some were centered around straight lines. There were others like this one right here that was just a bell jar with a enclosure on the bottom. And all of these are different types of Wardian cases, which now we would refer to as terrariums. And so these were the predecessors to what we now use to make terrariums. And so when we talk about terrariums, we start to think about some of the same principles that Dr. Ward was discovering. Do we want them enclosed to retain that moisture and needing less watering? And what is the downside to that? So the downside to that is that because of the increased humidity, there is a risk of disease buildup because of that higher humidity. So depending on how much water you put down here in the bottom, when you initially water it, it's going to evaporate up and then it's going to condense back down on these plants. And if there are any bacterial or fungal particles that are in here from when you enclosed the terrarium, they're going to start developing. Disease can also come from the soil medium that you used if it was not properly sterilized or if it's a medium that you're reusing. And we can have the open or dish gardens as well. And this has lower humidity, but we need to tend to them and monitor them more often to check for moisture content, as well as depending where they are in your home or your office, then there may be a risk of disease particles in the air from bacteria or fungi floating through the air. But if there's good air current and movement, it should disrupt any of the bacterial or fungal spores from German, or not germinating, but growing. When we talk about containers, they should be able to let in light. So we want them to be transparent. Most of those are going to be glass or plastic. And this can totally depend on what you're comfortable with. If you have a lot of glass containers that you may have inherited, or if you're a thrifter, you might find at the local thrift store, any of those containers can be used and turned into a terrarium. 
I know some people have a concern if they have pets like dogs or cats, or if they have small children, having those bigger pieces of glass or glassware around might be an issue. And almost any type of container can be used. So if you have an old fish tank, that could be used or a fish bowl, any old glass jar with or without a lid. And a lot of those heavier, thicker glass jars that have been passed down from family to family or you find at antique sales, a lot of those are good for terrariums because they're big, they're thick, and they really do have a good seal attached to them. You can use a jug or like I did for today's presentation, I used bottles. And these were just recycled bottles that had been donated to my office. I also got a couple of the other containers from local members in my community who were willing to donate them to me for this program instead of throwing them away. And also uh, one that I've been seeing more in the last five years is light bulbs. So people using old light bulbs to make a terrarium out of. I haven't figured that one out yet. I've seen some where they've cut a hole in the glass and made it a terrarium where it's on its side. And there are some that you just unscrew the top and then put all of your materials in there. Here are a couple of examples of containers that were donated um, by members of the community. So these back here, these are obviously adult beverage bottles that have lids. And when I saw this one in particular, that's what made me think of the ship in the bottle because it's like the ones that my friends used to do as a, when we were kids. This container right here, this was donated by a member of our office staff. And this is just an old candle that she had put in a warmer that had the lid. She put it in a warmer and when all the scent was gone, she cleaned it out and asked if I wanted to use it for my terrarium um, program. This, let me see here. This one right here, ooh, don't like that color. Let's see if we can go with a little bright one. So this one right here, this one is a fishbowl that was purchased from the local dollar store. And the dollar store is going to have a lot of the materials that um, you can use to make terrariums. And so terrariums don't have to be those expensive things that we do, those expensive craft projects. They can, or you can do them the simplified versions as well. And then this container right down here, this is just a yogurt container that was washed out and it's really a thicker glass material that could be used for an open terrarium. Or if you wanted to make it a closed terrarium, you could put some saran wrap or some plastic wrap on there and rubber band it shut. But these two bottles right here were the ones that I really liked because they come with the cork and they have a very unique design to them. So it made making a bottle terrarium a challenge because of the shape. So with these two, it's not straight down into the container and we'll talk about this in a little bit but it curves right here at the the neck of the bottle and so getting into the base of this container when you start filling it up becomes a challenge so I'll talk about how I overcame that challenge so let's talk about growing material that can be used and The best 
piece of advice that I can give you is right here as number one. It must be clean, well-drained, and high in organic matter. Depending on the type of plants you're going to be using, a standard potting mix or a peat perlite mix is going to be an excellent choice. I say that because a lot of the potting mixes that are for sale have been pasteurized and heated so that they are more of a sterile mix and you don't have to worry about those um, disease issues using these. The growing medium can be changed though depending on the type of plants you're using. So if you're using more desert-like plants, you could use a sandier mix or if you are theming this to be a specific scene or type of material, you can change that, that material out. If you're going to make your own mix though, here are some suggestions. So you can mix one part peat moss with one part garden rich soil. And so remember, garden rich soil is going to have microbes and bacteria in it. And so we'll want to sterilize the mixture before we're using it in our terrarium. So some standard steps to sterilize the, the mixture. You want to moisten it, cover it with aluminum foil to keep it from drying out while it's being heated, and then place it in your oven at 200 degrees for about 30 minutes or so just until it's heated through, and then leave the, the aluminum foil on top and just allow it to cool over the next hour or so. And what this is going to do is that moisture that you put in there is going to essentially steam clean that mixture for you. Fertilizer, I haven't used fertilizer in my terrariums yet. It's usually not necessary because we don't really want the plants to grow rapidly. We're going to be looking for plants to be more slow growing or having a mounding type habit. And so fertilizer usually provides them with more nutrients that they'll then start getting bigger and have to be either transplanted or pulled out of there. You can add a little bit of fertilizer if you start noticing some yellowing or discoloration from nutrient deficiencies, but I would do this after the plants have been established. When we're first putting the terrarium together, we're going to have a lot of sensitive roots. And sometimes when we add fertilizer, the salt in there can affect the roots. And this is especially helpful for those soilless mixes, like your standard potting mix or garden soil that we've heated that hadn't had any fertilizer for from it before. And so depending on the soilless mix you use or the potting mix, some of those do have those starter charges in them. And so you don't want to add too much to the terrarium. All right, so what can we plant in our terrariums? Well, there are a lot of different plants that you can choose from. Any, any plant that you would have a house as, as a house plant could be used in your terrarium. Depending on the size of your terrarium and the overall theme of your terrarium, this is going to be some of those limiting factors. So I wouldn't want to put a philodendron leaf into my terrarium if I'm only going to use a standard 750 milliliter bottle. It's not going to give it enough room to grow. But if I was going to do a giant container, then if that fit my theme, then I might consider that. You also wanna consider 
the temperature of the room where you're going to hold hold or place your terrarium and what those light conditions are. And so where I have mine upstairs, it's in a one window room with an east window. So it gets morning light, but after about 11 o'clock, the sun is past that window. And so there's not a lot of sunlight being directed in there. And so with the plants that I chose, I also put a, a grow light in there just to help all of my plants that I've brought in for the winter to start growing. And then of course, any good tip for choosing plants, always start out with healthy or disease-free plants. I know it's sometimes hard to resist those clearance plants and I'm guilty of buying a couple of them myself, but it does take a lot more work to get those unhealthier plants back to a healthy state, especially when we're doing something that's going to be enclosed and potentially have an increased rate of bacteria or fungal diseases. So as I mentioned, plants that have a low dense growth habitat are going to be best because the ones that are going to grow tall or sprawl out, depending on your container size might take over and then you lose the plants that you have in there rather quickly, either due to shading out or from the bigger container or the bigger plant causing competition for you. And so larger plants can be still used, but you wanna make sure that the small, if they're in a smaller terrarium, you wanna cut them back so that they don't grow as quickly or take over. And so I've mentioned a couple of times a theme, a theme, a theme, a theme. What, what do I mean by a theme? So, a couple of the pictures that I've shown you so far have had some kind of whimsical theme associated with them. So I believe it was the first or second picture I showed you had some toys in there, a small bumblebee. This one is a terrarium with a toy car in there. And you can see that the moss that they used underneath is also overgrowing out of the car. And so they, they've used this as an abandoned car where the plants are starting to take over. We can also think of a woodland theme. So using more wood type plants, using some tree bark or some stick pieces in there to create that woodland appearance. A desert theme, using more soil or succulent or sand or succulent plants to create that illusion of being on a desert plant or in one of the desert states. Using more tropical plants and creating a tropical or whimsical theme, you can use the smaller, I'm, I'm gonna call them fairy sized items that you can find at the store that it can be used in fairy gardens. I've also seen some that have a tropical or a beach feel to them. And so those can be used in here. So you could put a small tiki hut, cut a piece of fabric and use it as a beach towel. Um, and then use some of those tropical plants as well as different types of rock to simulate a ocean or a sea that might be somewhat tropical. A fairy garden, I've had a couple of questions about this one. Can I turn my terrarium into a fairy garden? And yes, you can. You can get some of those smaller items from the store, depending on the size of your container. If you're going to use one of those big terrariums, like you've seen on the first slide, where it was a bigger bottle terrarium, depending on the opening of the terrarium is going to be another limitation as well. 
when we get to some of the pictures later from my assembly, I actually had to trim a couple of things down to get them in my terrarium. And then I always encourage, use your best, your favorite movie, your franchise to also create a theme for your terrarium. So one of the most famous scenes that I think about was from the movie Star Wars. And when Luke Skywalker crash lands on Dagobah in the swamp, I have seen that for fish tanks. I've seen it for terrariums. People have recreated that multiple times. For this one in here, Avatar, because it's got a lot of imaginative types of plants and colors, and you can do a lot of fun things with that. And then because we're getting close to uh, Halloween, and this movie was recently on when I was creating this presentation, the carnivorous plant from Little Shop of Horrors can also be some inspiration for you. And we can actually use carnivorous plants in our terrariums, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So one of the considerations that we have is for our height of our plants. Terrarium plants can be divided into three different size groups. So some smaller plants that are going to be between one and six inches. Now that can be both height and it can also be width. Some medium plants, which will be six to 12 inches and tall, which is going to be over 12 inches. For the pictures that I've incorporated towards the end where I'm assembling, I've stuck with all small plants and that is simply because of the size of my container. As I mentioned, I used one of those cork bottles that had a wider base, but a smaller opening. And so that was my determining factor, was the size of my opening. As we mentioned, you have to keep your light conditions in consideration. Most terrariums are going to need at least a medium light requirement for this category which means that they're going to need about four to eight hours of light every day. And that could be sunlight, filtered light, or supplemental light. Plant growth lights can be used depending on the type of plants you use. Some of them are going to need them, as well as if you put them in a low light room, that's also going to be a requirement. And one good thing to keep in mind is that your terrarium should be placed within several feet of a bright window, but not in the direct sunlight. Because these are going to be indoor house plants, they won't be as acclimated to direct sunlight or direct light as some of our other house plants. And so, the other thing to think about is because we're using a glass or a plastic, that will magnify the sunlight and increase the temperature as well as the heat of that container. And so if it's in direct sunlight for too long, then it essentially will cook or steam your plants. Many of the terrarium plants are going to be tropical in nature, which means that they'll be well suited for normal house temperatures. With winter approaching, I think about my own house. I, I own an older home. And so for my upstairs, my upstairs is going to get colder than what it would be on the main level. And so, if it starts to get too cold in the room that I have them, I'll have to take that into consideration and either put in a heat pad for my plants or bring those down to the main level of the house where it's warmer 
so that I'm not dipping below those um, minimal night temperatures for our plants. But usually most of our terrarium plants are going to tolerate about the low 60s as the cutoff for their night temperatures. So now let's get into some good plants that we can use. And we're going to start off with our desert terrarium theme. And so when we think of a desert terrarium, we're going to think of a sand or a cactus mix. And so that's going to lead us to succulent plants. So some possible examples are going to be our Kalanchoes. One popular one that I really like in the Kalanchoe family or Kalancho family is the panda plant. And this is a really cute succulent that the um, leaves look like a panda paw. And depending on the type of panda paw or panda plant that you get, they will range each leaf in about an inch to four to five inches. So this, when we think about it for our plant characteristics, this is going to be one of those medium or large sized plants that we would use for a terrarium. So our hens and chicks, these are going to be a mounding habit plant. So they're going to spread out more than getting taller. So depending on your cultivar, most of the Semper Vivums are going to be in that small to medium category for plants. And Semper Vivums were what I used for my terrarium later on in the presentation. The Crassulas, also known as the jade plants, the Echeverias and the sedums or the stone crops can also be used as a terrarium plant as well. This was when I was talking about the carnivorous or insectivorous plants. So looking at sundews, Venus flytraps, and pitcher plants that can be used in a terrarium that's either closed or open. If it is open like this one is here, there's going to be more opportunity for those insects to fly inside to feed the plants. Air plants, this is a popular one that I see at a lot of indoor gardens as decorating hallways, the botanical centers when you're walking through the hallways. These are always hanging from the ceiling. And so these are just glass balls that are open with a little bit of media in there. And then the tillandsias are inside the air plant as well. And these are just held by either string or if you don't like the look of this rope or string, you can also use a heavy gauge fish line and that should be strong enough to hold these from the ceiling. Some tools, what do we need to actually put these terrariums together? So you're going to need some long sticks or some dowel rods, and these are going to be good for digging holes, moving the plants. If you have some taller plants that might need a little support, these can also be cut to width and left in there. And if you do that, you want to think about how you're going to hide it if it's something that you don't want to be seen. Terrariums, you can either build them to be seen on all sides, you can build them to be seen on from the front, or they can be seen from three sides. Scissors are going to be very helpful. Not only will they be used to prune any plants as you're putting them in there, but they'll also be used to cut your long sticks or if you have to trim any of your items that you're going to be putting in there, they'll be very beneficial. A large spoon, this is going to help put the growing media in the container. A funnel can be used out of paper or aluminum foil. For me, I just used my hand over it to give it a little bit more um, of a 
support as I put the media in there and that can be used as well. A atomizer or bulb spray might be helpful to mist the plants. If you don't have any of these, a standard kitchen bottle or what you might use at a hair salon, any of those can be used as well. One tip here that I didn't mention with the media is that I pre-moisten my media. That way I don't have to worry about adding more moisture to the plant if I'm concerned with any disease issues. And then a stick with a wired loop, this can be used for lowering plants into the container, especially those with small openings. And one thing that I added to the list, but I didn't have room to put on here, was pipe cleaners. And so you can group three or four pipe cleaners together, and this will allow for manipulation around corners while you're putting plants in a terrarium. And so I'll show you in a couple of slides how I used the pipe cleaners. Some accessories that you'll need when putting your terrarium together, and this can be based on your theme or if you want to include any of this, rocks, gravel, shells, moss, the ceramic figures, if you're going to use any of the fairy or small figures to make a scene. Dried flowers can be used and other natural materials. One thing that we want to be cautious of is introducing any insects or diseases with those accessories. So for the rocks, the shells, and the gravel, what I do is just get a pot of boiling water on the stove. It can be a rolling boil and just put the rocks and the shells in there and gently boil them for about five minutes and then allow them to cool. And what this does is this sterilizes those found objects so that you're not introducing those disease or insects. The other thing, if you're going to be using any figures, toys, the ceramic structures, or if you're gonna be using any kind of cars, you'll wanna clean those with a 10% bleach solution or an alcohol solution and allow those to dry. And this is just a quick way to sterilize those as well. Assembly, so you're gonna wanna think about your size, your color, your textures, and create a variation. So this is just like flower arranging where you um, need to think about the picture as a whole. So what do you want it to look like? Some ideas, putting those taller plants in the back, shorter in the front. You can sketch out a plan to give you a little bit of foresight for what you want this to look like. Or if you're like me, when I did a couple of mine, I just kind of, all right, I've got these materials in front of me. How do I want it to look that day? And so when we do our assembly, we use our rocks, sand, and wood, and other natural materials. We can use those to create cliffs. So we've got a little bit of a sandy beach here with an incline, then that leads to a cliff where there's more plant material up above. Before you plant, you also want to make sure that you're cleaning and disinfecting your container inside and out. Just use some hot soapy water, rinse it out thoroughly so that there's no soap residue and leave that to air dry. You can also use a 10% bleach solution if you're concerned about using a detergent and then leaving it to dry as well. I would recommend, even if you're buying a new container or if this is one that you've had for a while, still disinfect it just to be on the safe side. 
So when we do our assembly, the first thing we want to do is add our drainage materials. And so always start off with a layer of stone or gravel at the bottom, like I have here. I just use some of those colored glass rocks that are available at your local craft store, dollar store. Then on top of that, what we want to do is put some activated charcoal. And this you can find at any garden center. And it helps with eliminating any chemicals that could prove to be toxic to the plant. So when you water, if there's anything in your media or on or in your materials, this just helps to bind any of that to all of the carbon that is inside the activated charcoal. And you wanna place about a half inch layer of the gravel or material at the bottom and sphagnum peat moss can be used over the level of gravel and charcoal. This helps to prevent the growing medium from sifting down into the drainage area. And so this is a picture of the activated charcoal that I got from the garden center and I just sprinkled some right on top. Do be careful and don't wear white when you're working with this because it is a charcoal and it does get everywhere if it gets crushed up. Then about a fourth of the terrarium's volume should be growing material and drainage material. So after you get your charcoal and your rocks on the bottom, you can put some peat moss or some sphagnum moss on there and then put your growing material on top. So this is just a standard potting mix that I used. And you can see that this is about a fourth, maybe closer to a third for my actual assembly. And the only reason I say it's closer to a third is this bottle has a convexed bottom. So it actually raises up here in the middle. And so it does look a little bit fuller than a normal container. And like I said, pre-moisten that just to start out with, it does save you in the, the future on that. Then you get to planting. And so the first thing you wanna do is you wanna take any of your plants from their pots and just lay them out on a mat or on the table in front of you. I'm using one of my daughter's school mats just because it's easier to clean. And you wanna trim off any yellowing or disinfect any damaged leaves. As you can see, maybe on this plant right down here, it does have some yellowing and some damage on there. So I did trim that off. This one has a diseased leaf right there. And so you do have to do a little bit of that trimming. And then when I took these plants out of their containers, I also found some baby offsprings as well. And so um, here are some baby sedums. This is a piece of jade. And so once I got my bigger plants into my terrarium, then I started looking, how can I use some of these baby plants to fill in and make a scene? Also trim off any of the roots. If the plants are extremely pot bound, these were not as they were still, they were in a very big pot and they were all spread out. Try to keep the folium from touching the sides of the container. So this goes back to Dr. Ward's observation that when that moisture in there condenses, it's going to condense and run down the side. And so if we can keep our plants a little bit away from the outside of the container, it's not going to allow moisture on the plants as much. After planting, moist the plant or mist the plants 
to wash off any growing media that has been stuck to their leaves or the sides of the container. This also provides a little bit more of that humidity and allow the container to remain open until the foliage has dried out. And so what this is doing is you're eliminating any of the chance for that foliage to start producing any bacterial or fungal growth before you even close it. Here are just a couple of examples of terrariums that I've done. This one right here, this was the first terrarium I did and it was what I call a candy jar terrarium. And so we painted pots, glued the terrarium bowl on top and then used the saucer that went with the pot as the lid. And so you can see we had a smaller growth here, uh, growing area. And this one, we got a little bit too much of that sand in there. And so it really did compress our growth. Lo very clear learning experience for me. Reduce the amount of media that was in here and then pick some smaller plants to use. Then here, these are two uh, terrariums that I did. One of them has a rock river path through it. And then this one also has another rock river path, but I themed this one for the movie, The Avengers. So uh, spoiler alert, if anybody hasn't seen that movie, Thanos puts himself on a distant planet and this was my envisioning of it in terrarium form. So I've got some plants around here, some rocks while he's outside of his shelter. And for this, this was actually one of my daughter's toys. But if we remember back to the container slide, it had a very small opening. So I did have to do some manipulation of this toy. I had to cut off a little bit of his arm. He had a stand on there, so I had to cut that off and I made it work. And it was a fun experience that I got to do with my daughters when we built these terrariums. For watering, since those three examples of terrariums were closed, they won't need to be watered for about four to six months. If they start to look wilted and there's no condensation in the terrarium itself, you might have either a crack in your seal or the lid wasn't put on properly. And so that moisture has been slowly escaping. So just lightly water it to refill that moisture. If you are doing an open terrarium, then you'll need to water that more closely and you might be watering that once a week during the winter time to maybe a couple of times during the active growing season. Some maintenance that you do with your terrarium, don't overwater. If you have a lot of water at the bottom of your terrarium, it is going to cause you issues. It's going to cause higher humidity and the plants themselves will start rotting and developing root rots because that moisture will start soaking in to that growing medium. The other thing, remove any dying leaves as you notice them. This prevents any decay issues that might turn up. And you want to turn it occasionally to keep the plants growing straight and narrow or straight and normal. If you have this and you don't rotate it, your plants are all going to start growing towards the nearest light source. So if that's a window that is on the right side of the container, you might notice that all of your plants are starting to grow to the right. And then frequent pruning and pinching may be required 
depending on the plants, just to keep those plants from growing up and have them grow out more or get a more compact habit. That's what we'd be using our pinching and pruning for. If you're interested in terrariums and are looking for some resources, there are a lot of extension fact sheets on terrariums and terrarium plants, but there are two books here, The Terrarium Craft and The New Terrarium that are good resources for helping build those terrariums. So, for pictures, they were a combination of my own and some Creative Commons pictures. Here is my contact information if you have any questions or want to chat about terrariums or some problems that do come up. The best way to reach me right now, since we are working some of those hybrid schedules right now, is through email, uh, brucejb at illinois.edu. And for that, I will put up the survey for the terrariums.